I hope you feel that way tonight. That if you were the only one, that Jesus would have come for you. I have that deep conviction in my heart, and it means so much to know that God loves us individually. We've been beaten down, rejected, pain and heartache, loneliness, but our Creator wants us to know we're precious to Him, and nobody can take your place with God. That's so precious. And He came because He wants you and I with Him forever to spend eternity with Him. Praise the Lord. Well, our subject tonight, Revelation's Judgment Hour is here. Turn with me, if you would, where we left off on Saturday night to Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, there's one part of this prophecy we did not have time to look into, and that is the judgment. And in Daniel chapter 7, beginning here in verse 9, we read about an amazing divine heavenly court scene. Daniel chapter 7, right there in the Old Testament, about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. Daniel 7 in verse 9. The Bible says, Daniel 7 in verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Here we see at the end of that 1260 year period before Jesus comes, a judgment scene set in heaven. And here we see the Ancient of Days. Who do you suppose the Ancient of Days would represent? God the Father. We're going to see Jesus here in just a moment. Look at verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. That was a term that Jesus took on himself. Came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which should not be destroyed. In Daniel 2, as we studied earlier on, that stone that was cut out out of a mountain without hands represented God's kingdom that would be set up on this earth that would never pass away. Here we see that before that stone comes, Jesus comes, there is a cosmic judgment seen in heaven to demonstrate and vindicate before the universe that God is fair. Notice what it says a little bit on. It doesn't stop with God. Notice now in verse uh, verse, uh, 18. Verse 18 says, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Notice what it says now in verse 22. Verse 22 said, the, verse 21 talked about the little horn would reign until, verse 22, the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now look at verse 26. Verse 26 says, after the reign of the little horn, after the time, times and a half a time, verse 26, the judgment shall sit, they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. So here we see very clearly taught in Daniel 7, before Jesus comes, a cosmic judgment. The Ancient of Days, God the Father, sits, and then the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, comes with all the holy angels, The judgment is set and the books are open. I'll tell you what. There may be someone in this room tonight that longs for justice to be served in some experience in your life. Folks, there's many times in this world that justice is not served. There are many things that are unfair. But someday when Jesus comes, it will be revealed that justice has been served in this cosmic judgment to enable God to visibly demonstrate to the universe who is safe to be in his kingdom and who has rebellion in their heart and is not safe to be in that kingdom. Turn to Revelation now, if you would. 
And let's turn in Revelation chapter 14. We read the same message in Revelation 14 in verse 6 and 7. As we're, going to, as we're getting into now the deep prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, God is bringing out the vital themes that we need to understand and embrace in the last days. Revelation 14, verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. So before Jesus comes in Revelation, we hear again, God calls attention to the hour of His judgment that God would be glorified in this heavenly judgment. Look at chapter 11 now. Revelation chapter 11, and notice what it says in verse 18 and 19. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. And the Bible says, Revelation 11 and verse 18, the nations were angry. Sounds like today. And your wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and those that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. Here's John. He's seen this judgment scene in Revelation. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. We studied on Saturday night about this little horn power, the same as the beast, and one of the identifying marks who would try to change God's times and laws. Folks, John saw in this vision, right there in the throne room of heaven, the Ark of the Testament or the Ark of the Covenant. And in that Ark is the Ten Commandment, Holy Law of God. Now, they can take it out of churches. They can take it out of courtrooms. They can say it's been nailed to the cross, but folks, according to the Bible, that Ten Commandment law is in heaven and it's eternal. We're going to study that Friday night. So the basis of the judgment is God's holy law. Now, turn over, if we, you would, with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God gives us another verse here to clearly teach about this judgment. You will virtually hear nothing taught today in Christianity on this judgment. And that's the way Satan wants it, because he wants to keep hidden from the people's view the spiritual preparation that God is calling us for these last days. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. The Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're not going to appear personally in this judgment that's going on in heaven right now, but our record, the books are open, our record will appear. Everyone may be, receive the things done in his body according that he has done, whether it be good or bad. There are literally scores of verses in the Bible teaching clearly of this great judgment before Jesus comes. Now you say, well, Rick, you know, I can see that. But I thought that when we accept Jesus, that we're saved. And of course, the Bible teaches that when we accept Jesus, we have salvation, we have eternal life. But folks, sometimes we get a little narrow-minded in our looking about spiritual things. <laughs> this whole cosmic judgment is not focused on whether you and I get to heaven. This whole cosmic judgment, as we're going to see, is focused on God finally being vindicated before the universe. You say, well, why does God need to be vindicated? Why does God, you know, need to be cleared? Well, we're going to find out just now. Turn back to the Old Testament, to the book of Ezekiel. Because in Ezekiel chapter 28, we read about some usurper in heaven or some rebellious one in heaven who began to slander and tear down the character and government of God. In Ezekiel, just before Daniel, it's the book before Daniel, Ezekiel chapter 28, and beginning here in verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12. Okay, Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. I'll give you just another couple of seconds to find it. If you have any trouble, just look in the index in your Bible. But it's just before Daniel, Ezekiel 28, 12. Moreover, the word, uh, sorry, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, You seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, the king of Tyrus 
is not the primary one that this prophecy is speaking of. Now, the king of Tyrus was a representation of the one, but the king of Tyrus was not in Eden before sin. The king of Tyrus here symbolizes Satan or Lucifer. Verse 13 says, You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And then it says, The workmanship of your tablets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers. Now, those words are very powerful in their meaning. The word anointed means someone who is open to receive a revelation. Wings outstretched, open to receive. And then it says, this cherub was the one who was anointed that covered. The word covered there means to join together or to unite. And so this heavenly being who is set aside by God, who is there to receive this blessing to join together or unite others, it says, God says, I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. In other words, he was in God's presence. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Here is a revelation of the incredible nature that God gave to Lucifer. God gave him the highest privilege to be in God's presence day by day and receive a fresh, deeper revelation of the character of God and then not only to receive it, but to go out and entwine or to go out and cover or to unite the other angels in that experience. Now, I want you to notice something very important. When God reveals his character, it's not just intellectually, but it's in our experience. It's in our life. That means that all created beings, as they continue to behold God and receive from God a deeper revelation of his character, are molded and fashioned and made more and more into his image, more and more into the likeness of his character. And so Lucifer had this exalted privilege. It was his joy. It was his pleasure to be in God's presence. That's what Joseph was talking about, our devotional time. God wants us to have a quiet time every day just with him that we can behold him right here now in this world and receive a deeper revelation in our experience today. But that was Lucifer's privilege, and then he would go and share with all the other angels. Now turn back a couple more books to the book of Isaiah. Because in Isaiah chapter 14, we learn more about this rebellion that we just saw here that would happen to Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. The Bible says, Isaiah 14 and verse 12, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Here we see that at some point in eternity past, Lucifer began to cherish rebellion in his heart against the government of God. He began to desire to have God's power. And yet, as he wanted God's power, he rejected God's love. And any time someone has power without love, they are exhibiting the same characteristics of Satan did right there. Now, it's fascinating in the symbolism here, because in verse 13, he said that he wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. The word stars there in the Hebrew, if you look it up in the concordance, means prince or princess. Now, a prince is a son of a king. Is that right? And so here God is revealing to us that God was not finished with his creation. God was going to create another order of beings. And we read about that in Genesis 1 and 2. God created an order of beings in his likeness and in his image. And so it appears here that Lucifer caught wind that God was going to create another order of beings and these beings would be in the very likeness and image of God. And he wasn't content to continue to fill his place in God's heavenly plan and he rebelled. And then he says in verse 14, I will ascend above the height of the clouds. 
clouds in the Bible represent symbolically angels. So Lucifer was no longer to content to be the covering cherub, the greatest of all the angels. He wanted to be above the new order of race and even be in God's throne and overthrow the government of God. Now, as I think about this, it is startling to realize what the Bible calls the mystery of iniquity. Sometimes people say, they say, Rick, you know, why did sin begin? You know, the Bible doesn't give us an answer to that because there is no reason. If sin had a reason for existing, then sin would be excusable. But there is no reason for sin to exist. It, re it exists because a perfect, holy being made to this glorious experience as Lucifer was, began one day to cherish in his own free thoughts and feelings and desires to cherish, to take God's place and to be discontented with his own created place in God's plan. You know, that's the problem with all of us today, isn't it? When we are unwilling to fill the place that God created us to fill. You know, one of the things that I love about God is that he doesn't make any mistakes. And when he created you, there is a place in God's heart that only you can fill. There's a place in God's heart that you, only you can minister to. Your value, my dear friends, does not come from how much money you have in your bank or how, uh, what kind of a wardrobe you have or all these external things that our society counts value. And your value is found in God's love and desire for you. And that is so precious and that is so beautiful. But when people reject God's plan for their life and people reject God's purposes, then that spirit of rebellion begins to work in our hearts and it destroys our ability and our willingness to have a relationship with our Creator. And so here we see in the Old Testament, God reveals that Lucifer began this rebellion. And as we study through the Bible in Genesis and then in the New Testament, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, he calls Satan the father of lies. Lucifer began to distort the character of God. He began to slander the character of God. He began to misrepresent the character of God. And as he did that, the angels in heaven that had been taught by Lucifer now were thrown into confusion. They didn't know what to believe. They didn't know what to think. Here is the very one who exalted Yahweh, the creator from all eternity as the creator of all things. And now he is slandering his character. He is distorting his character. He's misrepresenting his character. Now people say sometimes, they say, Rick, if God knew that Satan was going to cause all this trouble, and then come down to this earth and call us, cause all this trouble, why didn't God just wipe them out right there? Now you think about what the angels would have thought. If all of a sudden the one that they had appreciated and the one they had loved, Lucifer, had been destroyed because of some of the things he was saying, and they couldn't comprehend who was telling the truth, the whole universe would have been thrown into eternal confusion, and those who had been created would serve God out of fear, they, said, they would say, wow, man, if God wiped out Lucifer just because he brought up a few points, he'd wipe me out too if I don't toe the line. And they would have gone on and served God out of fear. For the sake of the peace and prosperity and the security of this universe throughout all eternity and the future, God knew there was only one way. And that was that everyone in the universe would have time to decide for themselves who was telling the truth and who was worthy of their allegiance. And so this cosmic judgment that we're studying about is about the record books of heaven being open to the universe and God finally being vindicated for being who he really says he is. You think about it today. When there's a terrible calamity in this world, what do the insurance companies call it? An act of God. Whenever things go wrong, most people, not everyone, but many people, who do they blame? They blame God. If God really loved me, why did he allow this to happen to me? If God was a God of love, why does he allow these bad things to happen? When God created this earth, folks, he created everyone with freedom and a corporate responsibility to look after one another. We have a responsibility for each other. 
And so when there is pain and suffering and heartache and people are hurting people, that's our choices. That's not God's choice. God created the earth perfect. So as we think about this judgment, before Jesus comes, there are amazing things that are going to be revealed to the universe. Lucifer claimed that God was unfair. He began to distort his character and tear it down, and the heavenly records revealed God's justice. Not only that, do you think the angels in heaven might be a little nervous about letting you into heaven? Do you think they might be a little nervous or real nervous about letting me into heaven? You better believe it, folks. Who was it that murdered God when he became human and came to this earth? Who was it? It was the church. It was the religious leaders. It was the religious people. So what we all see on the outside doesn't mean anything to God. Profession means nothing to God. What God sees is that the Bible calls it the heart. And in the heart is where our attitudes and our motives lie buried from all human view, sometimes from our own view. And so the angels can't read minds and the angels can't read motives. So in this heavenly judgment, God is revealing to all the created beings in the universe who is safe to bring up to heaven that will never treat Jesus that way again. You see, the angels love God more than we can imagine. And they want to make sure that Jesus is never treated the way he was treated 2,000 years ago. And so there's a lot of issues in this judgment. There's a lot going on right now. There's a lot at stake for the eternal welfare of this universe throughout all eternity. And that's what we want to study here tonight. Acts 17, verse 31, the Bible says, Because he, God, has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. We just read that in Daniel chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Hebrews 4 and verse 13, Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say to you that from that for every idle word men shall speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be contend, condemned. He, 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 Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. God told Moses, he said, Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so you shall make it. So God told them to make this earthly sanctuary after the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. Now turn to Hebrews with me if you would, because we're going to get into this judgment and we're going to see how the Bible unlocks the keys of understanding God's plan of restoring this universe. It's very beautiful and very precious. Okay, Hebrews towards the end of the New Testament, just a few books back from Revelation, Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 1 to 5. Get the first couple of verses on the screen here. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now look at verse 3 in your Bible. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, where it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for. See, saith he, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to you on the mount. So the earthly sanctuary was a pattern of the heavenly temple. And it reveals the gospel of God to restore fallen human beings to an eternal loyalty to God and an eternal security for the universe. It's a beautiful and precious service. Now, in that Old Testament service, we learn some very vital understandings of what leads up to the judgment. When a person sinned, 
They were to bring an animal, sometimes a lamb, sometimes a, a turtle dove if they were poor, sometimes a larger animal, but they were to bring that animal right through the eastern gate here, and then they would come in, and the priest would meet them there. And then they would put their hands on the head of that animal. Turn to Leviticus, if you would, with me. I want you to see it there. Third book in the Bible, way back in the front of the Bible, Leviticus chapter 4. And let's notice here what it says. They were to put their hands on the head of that uh, uh, animal and confess their sins. Okay, in Leviticus chapter 4 and beginning here in verse 4. Okay, Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says, He, the sinner, shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. So here we see when that person brought the sacrifice they killed it, symbolizing it was our sins that would crush out the Lamb to come, Jesus Christ. By the way, they were never taught that that animal brought forgiveness in and of itself. They were always taught that that animal represented the Lamb of God, Jesus, who was to come. But after that, then they would take that flesh of that animal and burn it on this, what's called the altar burnt sacrifice, right here. All this was called the courtyard. This is the tabernacle here. This was the courtyard. Now, what does that altar represent in the courtyard? Let's go to Hebrews again. We're going to be Hebrews a lot tonight, so you may want to keep something there. Chapter 13. Because the Bible explains to us very clearly what that altar represents. Now, the book of Hebrews was written shortly before the temple would be destroyed in A.D. 70. And Paul was trying to prepare the believers to recognize that that earthly system was no longer needed. It was done away with by God at the cross, but they continued to do that service. But notice what it says, Hebrews 13, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 13, and verse 10. And the Bible says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So according to the author of Hebrews, that altar in the courtyard represented the cross of Christ. And that's where the sacrifice was consumed. Jesus gave his all on the cross. And so a sinner brought an animal put their hands on the head of that animal, symbolizing the transfer of guilt from the sinner to the sacrifice. And then that animal was killed by the sinner. And then it was burned, the body was burnt uh, on that altar. So we recognize that that service that went on every day symbolized the cross of Jesus Christ. Now the difference between Jesus and the animal sacrifices is this. Jesus, Hebrews tells us, only had to die once for all people for all time. One sacrifice forever. There is no need of another sacrifice. Jesus made it all, paid it all. Praise the Lord. And when, when he said it is finished on the cross, what he was meaning is that that work was paid in full. Your sin debt and my sin debt was paid in full on the cross. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9 and verse 22, the Bible says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. There's no other way to remission or reconciliation than through the sacrifices of Jesus. The Old Testament sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus' sacrifice. So that altar represents the cross that was in the courtyard, symbolizing the death of Jesus on the cross. Now, this is such a fascinating part of this service. That's the outer court, and there was the altar of sacrifice, symbolizing the death of Jesus. That was the work of sacrifice. Now, most people who go to church are never taught any more than this. 
They're taught that, well, Jesus died on the cross, you accept Jesus, and that's it. But folks, the Bible doesn't stop there. That's the foundational bedrock for us to experience this incredible connection and eternal relationship with our God. But turn now to Romans chapter four, if you, uh, chapter 5, if you would, right there in the New Testament, right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Acts, and then Romans. Okay, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, because the Bible does not teach that we're saved by the death of Jesus. The Bible teaches that we're reconciled by the death of Jesus. Notice what it says here in Romans 5 and verse 10. The Bible says, Romans 5 and verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His, what does it say? His life. And so Christ's death reconciles us, but it's His life that saves us. We're going to see that as we go on here. And this is why, because most people are not taught this and they don't understand how to be saved by his life, we have such lukewarmness and apostasy in the Christian church. And so God is giving us some very precious biblical insights as we study the sanctuary service. Now, in, we don't have time to turn there, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, the Bible says that Jesus' death reconciled, does anybody know how many people? Reconcile the whole world unto God. His death embraced a whole lost race. Then you say, but then why isn't everybody saved? We're going to get into that as we're going here now. Now, let's turn back, if we could, to the book of Hebrews again. And now we're going to study how the life of Jesus saves us. Notice what it says here in Hebrews chapter 9. Okay? Hebrews chapter 9. Okay? The Bible, we'll find it in Hebrews there. We want to find how the life of Jesus saves us. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. Then verily the first covenant, or first testament, also had ordinances of divine service and an earthly or worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread. Okay, so here we go. We've got the ordinances, worldly sacrifice, the candlestick, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So inside of that sanctuary, there was the seven-branch candlestick. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, John sees this heavenly vision. This is after Jesus went back to heaven. In chapter 1, he sees Jesus walking up and down amidst the candlesticks. But in chapter 4, he and God interprets that those candlesticks represent the seven spirits of God or the Holy Spirit. Now, in John chapter 12 and verse 48, the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. And so those candlesticks represent the life of Jesus given to every human being. But then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says that you and I are to be the light of the world. Now, how is that going to happen? Now, I want you to remember something very important. The Holy Spirit is given to live out the life of Jesus and the believer. So when we embrace Christ's reconciliation at the cross and we praise God for His forgiveness and for taking all of our guilt and all of our shame, at that moment, God sends the Holy Spirit and fuels us with the life of Jesus. The Holy Spirit begins to live out the life of Jesus in us, symbolized by those seven-branch candlesticks. Not only that, there was a table of showbread. You can't see it all here, but there, was, there were 12 loaves of bread. They would change once a week. And Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 51, he says, I am the bread of life. And in that chapter, he goes on to say that unless we eat, his flesh and drink his blood, unless we feed on him, that we have no life. And then he goes on to say in chapter 6 of John that the words that he speaks, they are spirit and they are life. And so we recognize that the showbread represents our feeding on Jesus through the word. As we studied the other night when we studied about salvation, the only way we're going to experience God's power is by spending time in God's word, receiving God's message and truth 
to us personally. And then there was one more article there. It was the altar of burnt incense, symbolizing, uh, Revelation chapter 8 brings this out, Christ's intercession to take our request to the Father that the Father may pour out His blessing and Spirit in our lives. And so that was the incredible work of the priest who is Jesus, as we already read, who connects us with the Father. Now I want you to think about it. If a person, let's say you've got a, a murderer, and you forgive that murderer, but don't change the murderer's heart, what's that murderer going to do? First chance he gets, he's going to murder somebody else. If you take a thief, and you forgive that thief, but don't change the thief's heart, what's that thief going to do? Next chance he gets, he's going to steal something else. So Christ's death reconciles us and brings forgiveness. Praise the Lord, because we can only develop a relationship with Him without any condemnation, knowing that we're forgiven. But there, the Holy Spirit, given by Jesus as our high priest, begins to work inside of us, begins to change our attitudes, begins to change our habits, begins to change our thoughts. The life of Jesus now is being lived out in us to bring honor and glory to the Creator. And so it's God's life in Jesus that saves us, that changes us, and makes us safe to be in heaven. Now I want you to think about this. Let's say God took everyone to heaven. Everybody claimed to be a Christian, took them all to heaven. But many of those people, heart, their hearts weren't changed. They still had bitterness in their heart. They still had hatred and dishonesty in their heart. And God took them all to heaven. What would happen up in heaven in this perfect environment? The same mess we got down here. It would start all over again. Folks, I want to tell you something. God has allowed sin one time so all the universe could see who's really telling the truth. But God owes it to the universe never to allow sin again. Not by taking away our freedom, but by changing the hearts of those who willingly and give, and, and give themselves willingly that God can change their hearts and their lives so we will be safe to be up in heaven and sin will never, ever come into this universe again. That is so precious and so beautiful. That's all taught. Now, turn back to Leviticus, Leviticus again because I want you to see something here that's very profound. Because when the priest took that blood or that sacrifice, the sinner was forgiven... But someone, Leviticus chapter 10, and someone had to bear responsibility for the sin while the sinner was still alive. That was also the work of the priest. So let's notice what it says here, Leviticus chapter 10. We saw in chapter 4 that the priest would take some of that blood and sprinkle it on the horns of the altar of incense inside the sanctuary, symbolizing a transfer of responsibility from the sinner to God, verse uh, chapter 10 and verse 17. Leviticus 10 and verse 17. Whereof, wherefore have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy, and God has given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord? Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. You should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. So when the sinner brought the animal and killed the animal, the sinner was forgiven. And then the priest either took some of the blood and sprinkled it in the sanctuary or would eat some of the roasted sacrifice symbolizing, as we see right here, now the priest bore the responsibility for that sinner's sin. The responsibility was not fully finished yet because the whole issues of the rebellion in the universe were not cleared up. So the sinner was forgiven, the sinner was set free, but the priest would bear responsibility. Now, who is our priest? Jesus Christ. Now, this is profound. This is very important. So, the sanctuary was defiled by the sin of the sinner. They were cleared, but now God took responsibility for it until the judgment. Jeremiah 17, verse 1 tells us, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altar. So the responsibility of that sin went from the sinner to the priest who is Jesus. Very, very important point. So we recognize here, 
This is the work of Jesus in heaven since he ascended. His work is to give us his life, symbolized by the Holy Spirit, symbolized through receiving the word of God, symbolized through his intercession to keep us connected with the Father. So his work there in the holy place, as he began at his ascension, is his work of intercession, the life of Jesus. Now, let's go on to the next point, and let's turn now, if we could, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Let's turn back there, Hebrews chapter 9, and let's go into that second part of the sanctuary. Remember, the earthly sanctuary was a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 9, and let's notice what the Bible says. Hebrews 9, beginning here in verse 3. We read the first couple of verses already. Now we want to read beginning in verse 3. Hebrews 9 and verse 3. The Bible says, After the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. What did John see in heaven in Revelation 11? The ark of the testament, the ark of the covenant wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Exodus 26 verse 34 and you shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Now when these things were thus ordained, this is verse 6 of Hebrews again, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. So here we see that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And what was in that Holy of Holies? We just read about it there. We want to see it. There was the Ark of the Testament. That's what John saw in Revelation 11. Folks, what I'm sharing with you tonight is essential for us to understand in these last days. The great majority of religious people are being deceived and lost because they don't understand what the work of Jesus as our high priest is. It's powerful. And so in that Holy of Holies, there's the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, and inside of that Ark, folks, is the Ten Commandment Law of God written with God's own finger on solid stone. Why is that important to know? Turn with me now one more book after Hebrews to the book of James. And let's notice James. Notice what it says here in verse... 21, okay? Actually, verse, let's see, verse, uh, verse 25, okay? James chapter 1 and verse 25. Notice what it says, James 1 and verse 25. And whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So here God calls his law the law of, what does it say? Liberty. Now, there's preachers I've heard say they call it the law of bondage. Folks, that's nowhere taught in the Bible. That is a man-made tradition and a deception. The Ten Commandments are a law of liberty. They can't save us, but they show us God's beautiful way. Now, look at chapter 2, because this is powerful. James chapter 2 and verse 10 to 12. James chapter 2 and verse 10 to 12. The Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of how many? All, for he that says do not commit adultery also said do not kill. Now if you do not commit adultery, yet if you kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as they that shall be judged by what? The law of liberty. So the standard in the judgment that's going on in heaven tonight is what? God's holy law. Hmm. You start to see why in the last 50 years? The devil's managed to get the Ten Commandments out of most of the churches. And more and more people are told that the law was nailed to the cross because the devil knows we're in the judgment. The devil knows these prophecies better than you and I, all of us put together, folks. And he knows the issues for the last days because the devil knows when this judgment is done, God will be vindicated and God will vindicate his people before the universe. And so he hates the subject of the judgment and he tries to bring in false theories to make people think it doesn't matter. But this, as we saw in Daniel 7, is part of God's last day message. It's beautiful 
precious and powerful. Right in there, the Ten Commandments, holy law of God. Now again, they don't save us. Jesus saves us. But when Jesus saves us, what does he as our high priest do? The new covenant, he's going to put those laws where? In our minds and in our hearts. Praise the Lord. Because when he puts them in our mind and our heart, we love to do God's will. And so we're going to see now a couple points of this judgment. Turn back to Leviticus, if you would. And notice what it says here in Leviticus chapter 16. This whole chapter is on what was called the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment. You see, in the earthly service, they were symbolizing what the heavenly service is all about. And once a year, on the tenth day of the seventh month, they had the Day of Atonement. And notice what happened on that day. We don't have time to look at it all, but there, there were two main players in this incredible work of final judgment. Notice what it says in verse 7. Uh, Leviticus 16 and verse 7. And he, the high priest, shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now the word for scapegoat in the Hebrew is the word azazel which means the adversary. So one of these goats represents the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, and one represents Azazel, the adversary, which would be who? Who's the adversary? Satan. That's what the word Satan means, antagonist or adversary. Now notice what it says here. This is very powerful. Verse 9. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, that's the one that represents Jesus, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, or Azazel, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So here we've got the two goats. Now look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, He will take the blood of the... Bo- uh, I'm sorry, verse 15. Verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that's the Lord's goat, that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil, that means into the Holy of Holies, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. You remember that the responsibility for sin had been transferred from the sinner to the priest. Who's the priest? Jesus. And into the sanctuary. So here we see God vindicating his people in this incredible cosmic judgment because now he's sprinkling the blood. The blood is what cleanses from sin or from total responsibility of sin. Verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he come out. He has made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. Now you say, why would the high priest need to make atonement for himself? Well, in Aaron's case, Aaron was a sinner. But in Jesus' case, he's the real high priest. Jesus never sinned. But remember, as our high priest, he's taken responsibility for our sins. And so here we see in this Old Testament service that the high priest was vindicated, God is being vindicated, and God's people are being vindicated by this final judgment. That is so beautiful, folks. That is so precious. It is so wonderful that God has helped us to see what these great cosmic issues are for us in the last days. Now, let's see what happened right now to this scapegoat, or Azazel. Notice what it says here as we go on. Verse 20. And when he has made an end, this is the high priest, to reconcile in the holy place, the tabernacle of the congregation, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Who did the Lord's goat represent? Jesus and his final, final cleansing, his final work of judgment, vindication. Now we got Azazel. Who does Azazel, the accuser of the brethren, represent? Satan. Notice what it says here. In verse 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. 
putting them upon the head of the goat, and he shall send them away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall be let go, let go the goat in the wilderness. Here we see symbolizing Satan finally taking full, or, or be, the full responsibility of sin being laid at the author of sin, the originator of sin, the devil himself. We're going to study that in a future night in Revelation 20, 21 and 22. So Satan is Azazel, the accuser, and he will finally be revealed to the whole universe that he and not God have been responsible for all this mess. Because I'm telling you folks, the devil has got almost everybody convinced that God is the bad guy and he's the good one in this, in this incredible deception that's going on. Folks, I can't wait for the day when this judgment is finished because if anybody deserves to be honored and glorified and vindicated, it is our Creator because He has sacrificed everything. He has given everything. He, all He's done is love and bless. And all these wrong ideas and all these false teachings that have misrepresented God, they'll all be blown to smithereens. And God will be seen before the universe for who He is and who He truly is. And the devil will be seen for who He truly is. I, tell you, I love this subject. It is so beautiful and so precious. Now, let's go back to Hebrews 9 because now we want to see our part those of us who are alive during this judgment, and this is also very profound. Revel, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and I want us to look now at verse 7. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 7. This is very, very fascinating. Hebrews 9 and verse 7. The Bible says, But in the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now the word error there in the Greek means sins of ignorance. So let's think about this. Jesus is the high priest. The judgment's going on. He's there before the Father. He's right there where that ark is, that ark of the Testament, the Ten Commandments. And let's say the thief on the cross, his name comes up. You know, the thief on the cross was saved right there. And he, he, he cried out to Jesus and he was saved right there. Praise the Lord. He'll be in heaven. But the angels in this judgment are saying, well, hold on a minute, Jesus. How in the world do you think this guy's safe to be, you know, to be in heaven? The last thing he did before he got nailed on that cross, he was out stealing. How do we know he's not going to do it again? How do we know he's not going to mess up things here in heaven? How do we know? So Jesus in the record is going to show his heart. God's going to open up his heart. And the angels are going to see that his heart was changed. That his heart, he was given a new heart because he received Jesus. And that he's safe to be in heaven throughout all eternity. But what about all the sins in his life that he never had an opportunity to change? Folks, they'll be blotted out because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. They'll be blotted out. And the whole universe will look at that thief throughout all eternity and there won't be any remembrance of any sins that he ever did. That is so beautiful. That is so wonderful. Praise the Lord. And he'll never remember any. But what about us who are alive today? Folks, I want to say something right here. It may blow your mind, but it's powerful. It's part of this teaching. You and I are not preparing to die. You and I are preparing to see a holy God coming in the clouds of glory without seeing death. And before Jesus comes, His work of intercession will be finished. And so notice verse 7. It's so beautiful. Notice what it says. Verse 7, right here. He offered the, this blood which cleanses us from sin for the errors of people, the sins of ignorance. That means that those of us who are alive, if we're truly Christians, we're going to be praying every day like David did in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting life. Now, I want you to think about this. Revelation 14, verse 7, it says, Fear God and give glory to Him. Why? For the hour of His judgment has come. Can you and I give glory to God if we have sin in our life that we're committing every single day, day after day, and we don't even know about it? Can we give glory to God? Yes or no? No way, folks. So those who are alive during this judgment hour that are truly born again, and they've been reconciled, and they're being saved by God's life, God is going to open up things in their life 
that are not in harmony with the character of God. Now, how are they going to see what God's character is like? They're going to be studying the Word, but in the judgment, they're going to go into the Holy of Holies by faith, and we're going to see the Ten Commandment Holy Law of God. And we're going to see the principles of that law revealed in the life of Jesus. And if there are any areas of our life that are not in harmony with the character of God because we love Him and our desire is to honor Him and glorify Him, we will confess them to Jesus and He will change us through His life. Isn't that precious? He comes in and works and changes us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you begin to see how lukewarm the Christian church is today as we study this incredible prophecy that we're in the judgment hour? Most people are not even searching the scriptures with their hearts and asking God to guide them into truth. And most people are saying, oh, listen, it doesn't matter. God knows I can't help myself. I'm just human. I can't really change anyway. Because the gospels so often that are being presented are not the true gospel, the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14, 6. But I'll tell you what, all over the world, God is bringing this truth to every heart, everyone who's hungry and thirsty to know God and to know His will and who long to bring joy and pleasure to God's heart and to bring honor to Him and glorify His name. And so day by day, they're searching, they're praying, they're surrendering all, and they're experiencing what the Bible calls the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God bringing Christ's life into their life, molding them and fashioning them into the image of God. Oh, I tell you, what a privilege God has given to us. To be alive during the judgment. God has given you and I the privilege. To be alive when Jesus comes. To bring honor and glory to him. You know as we close this subject here tonight. I know I'm excited about it. It's, I mean, as I began to understand the judgment as a young Christian. It changed my life forever. You know you think about it. If someone said to you. You know Jesus was going to come tomorrow afternoon at 3.30. Would you live your life any differently than you're planning on living it now? I hope your answer is no. Because if we understand this beautiful truth we've been studying tonight, we will live day by day and hour by hour in the very presence of God, and we're going to be asking God, prepare me that I may honor you. Folks, this cleansing that happens in God's people does not save us. What saves us is embracing the death of Jesus as our reconciliation and righteousness. But it does bring honor and glory to God. Because I'll tell you what, the greatest embarrassment to our Creator throughout all the ages has always been through those who professed to be His followers but misrepresented Him. That's right. You know, God owes it to everybody alive on this earth that before Jesus comes, everybody will be able to make a clear decision of who God is to accept Him as He is or to reject Him. And how are they going to do that if God doesn't have a people who are walking in the will and the light of God through the Holy Spirit? So God owes it to the universe to bring His people, it's called the church in the Bible, to bring them to this cleansing, this, this place where they're totally sold out for Jesus. And that's the time in which we live. And so God's way is found in the sanctuary, Psalm 77, verse 13. And so the sanctuary reveals how God has dealt with the sin problem. Christ's death on the cross, paying the sin debt, reconciling the world to Himself, Jesus being resurrected, our high priest, there in heaven connecting everyone whose hearts are open and doing a final work of cleansing and vindication and that God would be glorified and vindicated and God would vindicate His people. Folks, it's all there as we've studied in the prophecies. Now listen to this as we begin to close. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of uh, goats and bulls, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Here God is saying that that heavenly realm 
needs to be finally vindicated before Jesus comes. But the heavenly things with better sacrifices, it's Christ's sacrifice and his priestly ministry that vindicates God. Here we look at in Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has not entered into holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Can you imagine John in vision, seeing? Because John knew the Old Testament service. He'd experienced it year after year. And he's in vision, and he's looking into heaven, and he's all his mind is clicking with these prophecies, and he realizes that Finally, God will be honored and glorified and vindicated and God will vindicate his people. He was so enthralled, it was so powerful for him. That's why in Revelation 1, God says those who study the prophecies and those who hear or embrace it, God says he has a special blessing, which is that incredible cleansing through the power of Jesus Christ. It's so beautiful. And there in Revelation, we see Jesus walking up and down in the midst of the candlesticks right there symbolizing his work of sending the Holy Spirit to bless. We already read in Revelation 11, the time of the dead that they should be judged. He's going to give reward to his servants and to the saints and destroy them that destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. That's where the Ten Commandments are. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The temple of God was open. John saw the ark with the commandments. He saw Jesus, the high priest, and he saw this incredible work of vindication and glorifying God. Now you say, Rick, I can really see this. This is really clear. Jesus died to reconcile me. He lives as my priest to save me. And it's his life in me. It's the Holy Spirit living out the life of Jesus. And that Jesus and Jesus and his followers will be vindicated finally once for all time. And folks, try to grasp this. That after Jesus comes and everything's said and done, sin will never, ever come into the universe again. Just think of it. There'll never, ever be another sickness. There'll never be anybody going hungry. There'll never be any death or war or fighting. There'll never be any uh, disputes or broken relationships. There'll never be anything of that nature. And folks, that's more real in this building. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming very soon, as we're going to see as we go into this seminar, because all the prophecies have been taking place. The next Bible prophecy to be revealed, folks, is the enforcing of the mark of the beast. And it could come at any time. And the, the masses don't even know. Oh, folks, I thank God that Jesus is our high priest. Now, you might be saying, well, Rick, you don't understand my life. I got some issues in my life. <laughs> I got some troubles in my life. I want to leave you with a promise right now. Turn one, one last text just before Revelation to Jude. Because when you totally and completely receive Jesus by faith, you surrender your whole heart to him, I want you to notice, he's, he's our intercessor. I want you to notice how God the Father in this heavenly judgment looks at you. Revelation chapter, I'm sorry, uh, um, Jude, just before Revelation. Jude, there's only one chapter, verse 24. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Tonight, when you receive Jesus fully and completely, you're not making deals with God. You're saying, Lord, all that I am is yours. All, who, everything about me I give to you. I, I surrender to you. Tonight, Jesus takes up your name in that judgment and he presents you before the Father faultless. That is so beautiful. God wants you and I day by day as we're fully surrendered, as he's revealing things in our life that we didn't know were out of harmony with his character. God wants you to know that all through that experience, we're being presented before the Father faultless like we never, ever sinned. What a way to live. No, Paul talks about it in Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, to those who walk in the Spirit. And so day by day, God wants to know as this cleansing is going on in our hearts, 
Jesus, our high priest, is presenting us faultless as if we never sinned before the Father and before the universe. Oh, man. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. All the past buried and covered by Jesus, and he is working in our lives and changing us day by day. And we have the pleasure to know that we are honoring him in our lives. You know, as you think about that, the Bible calls God's true followers witnesses. And so in this judgment, we have the privilege of witnessing in favor of our God by choosing for Him to take out of our hearts anything that's not like Jesus. We have the privilege and we'll have that knowledge in our hearts throughout all eternity that we stood fully for God in this time of his judgment. And we'll have that pleasure throughout all eternity to know that we are willing to honor God. Oh, folks, what a motivation to live. What a motivation day by day for God to search our hearts because our whole life becomes yielded to bringing joy and pleasure and honor to him. You know, the motivations that are so prevalent in Christianity today, we're going to see this uh, Thursday night, are sickening to God. In Revelation 3, it talks about uh, how God feels during this time of judgment with those who profess to be His followers. And it says that He feels nauseated. He feels like throwing up. Because there's so much self-centered motivation in Christianity today. What's in it for me? I want to make sure I get to heaven so I don't have arthritis. Now, folks, heaven's going to be a zillion times better than we can imagine. But if that is the level of our motivation then we're not going to enter in to that heart experience with Jesus. We're just going to be in it for ourselves and we wouldn't be safe to be in heaven. Heaven is not about you and I butting our way in and elbowing our way in. It's about going in to serve God throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. So as we close tonight, I know we've studied something very, very deep and very profound, but I believe it's one of the most beautiful teachings and prophecies, the judgment. Tonight, if you would just bow your head with me and close your eyes. And tonight, if you would choose to say to Jesus, Jesus, I didn't really understand the depth of what life is all about. And I'm getting glimpses that life isn't all about me, but life is all about you. And that, Lord, we're thankful that you are opening up to us what is being held back from the great majority of people today. You're opening your heart and you're asking us to come near to you and to be searched and cleansed and molded by you that you might have the joy and the pleasure to make us the people you created us to be in the beginning. Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you took our guilt and you've reconciled us totally, completely to the Father through your death on the cross. Jesus, we thank you you didn't stop there. You went to heaven. You became our high priest. And you're saving us now through your life. You're living out your life in us through your Holy Spirit. And in this judgment, you are our advocate. You are our intercessor. And it's your righteousness that cleanses and changes us and enables us to be fully accepted by the Father. And it's your life living in us through your Holy Spirit that enables us to show other people what you're like, to honor you and to bear fruit for you and to bring pleasure to your heart. Paul, oh, bless each one of us as we go home tonight. Tonight, if you would say, Jesus, I choose for you not only to be my sacrifice, but to be my high priest. I just invite you to raise your hand just now. Just lift it up to heaven. Raise your hand up. Say, Jesus, I choose for you to be my high priest, my intercessor. Just put it down. Just put it down. Thank you, Lord, that each one who made that decision tonight, Jesus, you are presenting them faultless before the Father. And Jesus, you will also search us and show us in our lives, any area in our life that's out of harmony with your will, with your character. And Lord, when you show us something new, 
Lord, create in us a deeper love for you that we would say, Lord, I'd rather have Jesus than that sin all covered up in my life. I'd rather have Jesus than that habit that's not in harmony with your character. I'd rather have Jesus and honor him than have anything in my life that's not according to his will. Bless us as we go home tonight, I pray. Draw us closer to Jesus. Keep us safe and bring us back together as we continue this amazing, exciting search in the prophecies to be prepared for your soon coming. We bring us back on Thursday night, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.